Good day, ladies. Welcome back to the YouTube channel that is really Menopause University. As you know, I'm Menopause Taylor and I'm a gynecologist. So I teach you everything you need to know in order to succeed in managing your menopause your way. This is video number 295 and it's on the risks of taking HRT versus the risks of not taking HRT. This video is important because sometimes you fail to look at a situation from both sides. It is very common for women to talk about the risks of taking HRT, but in doing so, they ignore the risks of not taking HRT. It is not my aim to push HRT. In fact, I don't care what you choose to do to manage your menopause. I just want to make sure you know the whole story on HRT. You will not find this material presented in this format in my book, regardless of whether you have the first edition or the second edition. Of course it's there, but not as a standalone separate comparison like the one we're going to do here today. So we are in the midst of a unit on the three big diseases that are due to estrogen deficiency at postmenopause, heart attack, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's disease. And you know, despite the fact that every woman on earth will have high risks for all three of these diseases as a direct result of losing her estrogen at the time of postmenopause, the vast majority of women aren't even aware of the fact that estrogen deficiency causes these three diseases. And one of the reasons they aren't aware of the connection between these three diseases and estrogen deficiency is because everybody talks about the risks of taking HRT and fails to mention anything about the risks of not taking HRT. I just think you deserve to know both. That way you can make your own decision as to which one weighs more for you. So what we'll do today is what I refer to as a balancing act. I'll present the known factual risks of taking HRT and balance them against the known factual risks of not taking HRT. And we'll use this scale. Have you ever heard of assumption of the risk? It's a legal doctrine of tort law, and I actually have a law degree as well as a medical degree. And in our discussion today, we're going to be talking about something that is a lot like assumption of the risk. It falls within the doctrine of assumption of the risk. In tort law, assumption of the risk is when a person is barred from recovering damages for an injury that they sustained by voluntarily exposing him or herself to the known danger. So if you voluntarily attend a baseball game and the ball flies into the bleachers and hits you, it's not the fault of the baseball players. You assumed the risk. You knew that the ball could get hit into the bleachers. You assume risks every day of your life. Every time you drive your car somewhere, you assume the risk that you might get into an accident. You know what the risks entail, and you voluntarily take the risk anyway. But you also know the risks of not driving your car. If you walk instead of driving, you risk being late to work or being unable to transport goods back home. And when you think about it, there are risks regardless of whether you take HRT or not. Either way, whether you choose to take HRT or not take HRT, you need to consider it an assumption of the risk. You assume the risk. And that's why you need to know both sides of the story, because you need to be able to make a good decision. The key is to know what they are in both circumstances. And that's why it's a balancing act. The problem with HRT is that everyone tells you only the risks of taking it and they omit telling you the risks of not taking it. So I'm going to make sure you know both. We'll start with the known risks of taking HRT. And first, let's just list them. Then I'll discuss each one separately so that you know the facts specific to each one. In creating this list of risks of HRT, we'll separate them 
into two groups. One will entail the disease risks, and the other will entail the side effect risks. You see, I think this separation is very important because some of the factors that dissuade women from taking HRT are really not risks at all. They're merely pesky side effects. They don't have any long-term or detrimental effects on your health. So the true risks of taking HRT include uterine cancer, heart attack, stroke, and blood clots. The side effects of taking HRT include breast tenderness, vaginal bleeding, weight gain, bloating, acne, and drowsiness. And now I'll delve into each of these individually so that you can weigh each one to the extent of risk that it represents for you personally. The left side of our scale will represent the risks of taking HRT, and the right side will represent the risks of not taking HRT. We'll start with uterine cancer. Uterine cancer is actually the one and only true, definite, genuine risk of HRT. And it's only a risk with regard to the estrogen component of HRT. If you've been a student here at Menopause University for any length of time, you know this so well <laughs> that you could probably deliver this portion of the tutorial for me. <laughs> Remember this? This is really an avocado, but it's the prop I use to demonstrate what happens inside your uterus in response to HRT. If I cut this uterus in half along its length, you can see the inner lining of your uterus. Estrogen causes uterine cancer because it causes this lining to get thick. And if it stays thick, it can turn into uterine cancer. So there is no doubt whatsoever that estrogen causes uterine cancer. But progesterone counteracts the action of estrogen on your uterus. Progesterone causes the inner lining of your uterus to either shed or never thicken in the first place, depending on how you take it. So progesterone causes your uterine lining to be like this. So estrogen does this, progesterone does this. So if you still have your uterus and you take HRT, you have to take both estrogen and progesterone. The only exception is if you've had a procedure called a uterine ablation that has destroyed the inner lining of your uterus completely. If so, you can take estrogen all by itself without progesterone, which, as you'll see later, has many, many advantages. So while estrogen does cause uterine cancer, as long as you balance it with progesterone, you erase that risk completely. No woman taking HRT should have to worry about uterine cancer as long as she respects this basic principle. So let's put the tiniest of weights on this side of the scale to represent the possible but improbable risk of uterine cancer from HRT. The next risk is heart attack. Now this is one of the risks that confuses women, and some doctors use it to scare you, but you needn't be confused or scared. It's really very simple and very logical. When it comes to HRT and the risk of a heart attack, it boils down to two basic things, aging, and timing. That's it. The bottom line is that HRT is a risk for heart attack only if you start taking HRT after the aging process has enabled your heart arteries to develop atherosclerotic plaque already. And that's all about aging. Estrogen is what prevents your heart arteries from aging. So they start out like this. As soon as you lose your estrogen, the aging process causes plaque to start building up in your heart arteries. You can barely see it, but there's a tiny bit of plaque right here. 
And the more your heart arteries age, the more plaque builds up. And if it builds up a lot, you become at very high risk for a heart attack. process is all about timing because the longer you go without estrogen the more your arteries age. So the aging is a consequence of estrogen loss. This means that if you start taking HRT early before your arteries have aged it prevents a heart attack. But if you start taking HRT late after you already have plaque buildup it can cause a heart attack. Combinations of early and late pertain to how much aging your heart arteries have endured and how much plaque has built up inside your arteries. There really is no universal specific time frame that applies to all women. So this particular risk is highly dependent on your personal circumstance. There is no way to designate how much of a risk this is in general for all women. So on our scale, your heart attack risk could be minuscule, or it could be significant, either way. Now closely related to heart attack is stroke. In fact, all the causes, risk factors, and pathology that pertain to heart attack also pertain to stroke. The only difference is that the arteries of concern are the ones that supply your brain instead of the arteries that supply your heart. So everything I just said about heart attack is the same for stroke. And that means the risk of stroke from HRT is dependent on aging and timing too. If you start taking HRT early in your postmenopause or before your carotid arteries have collected a lot of plaque buildup, your risk of stroke is very low. But if you start taking HRT late in your postmenopause or after your car carotid arteries have already collected, a lot of plaque buildup, your risk of stroke is high. Now we come to blood clots. You know, this one is very, very interesting. I'm always surprised to see how much women focus on blood clots when they become postmenopausal. And that's because with regard to your risk for a blood clot due to hormones, postmenopausal hormones present a lower risk of blood clots than any other time in your life. Do you know what constitutes the biggest risk of all for a blood clot? Pregnancy. And how many women worry about a blood clot then? None of them. Second to pregnancy is the high dosage birth control pills of yesteryear. Birth control pills have always been classified by the dosage of estrogen they contain. Way, way back when birth control pills first became available, they contained as much as 50 micrograms of estrogen. They were considered high dosage. The progestin component varied consisting of different kinds of progestin, and the higher the estrogen component, the higher the progestin component. Dosages of estrogen between 30 and 35 micrograms are considered moderate dosage. And dosages of estrogen between 20 and 30 micrograms are considered low dosage. And nowadays there are even ultra low dosage birth control pills which contain between 10 and 15 micrograms of estrogen. The high dosage pills aren't even available anymore and nowadays most women take the low dosage or the ultra low dosage pills. Even then, the risk of a blood clot from birth control pills is higher than the risk of a blood clot from HRT. And that's because HRT contains even lower dosages of estrogen and progestin than birth control pills. Yet, most women give nary a thought to blood clots when they're pregnant or taking birth control pills, but when menopause hits, they are suddenly terrified of blood clots. Ironic, isn't it? The risk of a blood clot with HRT is quite small. In the WHI, the Women's Health Initiative Study, this is the statistic that scared everybody to death. The media reported that the risk of a blood clot increased 100 percent 
What they didn't tell you were the actual numbers. Well, you know me, I tell you everything, so here are the actual numbers. <laughs> In the women who did not take HRT, 8 out of 10,000 had a blood clot. And in the women who did take HRT, 16 out of 10,000 had a blood clot. Sounds a lot more insignificant than 100% increase, doesn't it? The fact is that there are many risk factors for a blood clot. And the older you get, the more likely you are to have those particular risk factors, other than pregnancy, of course. So other than pregnancy, the risk factors for a blood clot include obesity, mostly morbid obesity, immobility, smoking, and any blood clotting disorder that's genetic. So when it comes to your risk of a blood clot with HRT, generally speaking, if you don't have any of these known risks of a blood clot, you don't have to weigh this risk very heavily. Most women who begin HRT early in their postmenopause have very low risk for a blood clot. And any hormone taken orally increases your risk of a blood clot more than any hormone that you don't take orally. This goes for estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Now why is that? Well, it's because the oral route requires the hormone to be degraded in your digestive tract before it can enter your bloodstream and your liver is part of your digestive tract. When any reproductive hormone undergoes degradation in your liver, it increases your risk of a blood clot slightly. This means that all HRT products via some other route, like patches, skin gels, skin sprays, vaginal rings, or IUDs, impose a lower risk of blood clotting. Of course, they all have their own unique risks instead of blood clotting. So the risk of a blood clot with HRT could be high or low, but because there are so many options, you can find one that carries a low risk for you. So let's put a medium weight on the scale for blood clotting, and that's being overly cautious because blood clots are not common at all. Are you starting to see how these risks are sort of like playing the lottery, I mean, your chances of winning the lottery may be one in a million. If you win, you're the one, but you're not likely to win. For blood clots, it's similar. The risk of a blood clot is very slim, and you're not likely to have one, but if you do, it would constitute quite a big risk. Now, all these risks of taking HRT are pertinent to the estrogen window of opportunity but not in the way you might think. The estrogen window of opportunity designates the first five to 10 years of postmenopause as the time when starting HRT is more beneficial than risky. But the risks of taking HRT are really more about how your body has aged in the absence of estrogen. So it's about aging rather than how long you've gone without estrogen. If the plaque in your heart and carotid arteries is minimal and your blood clotting tendency is low, your risk of taking HRT is low regardless of how long you've gone without estrogen. This is why I tell women to have consultations with me. So many of them find that they are still excellent candidates for HRT long after their window has closed. So HRT is risky if your heart arteries, carotid arteries, or blood clotting tendency have become prone to heart attack, stroke, and blood clots, period. In those instances, HRT increases your risk. But if your heart arteries, carotid arteries, and blood clotting tendency have stayed healthy and at low risk for these things, then your risk of taking HRT is also low. And that's it for the known risk factors of HRT. Did you notice what isn't on the list? Breast cancer. And that's because there is no proof that HRT causes breast cancer. Despite all the talk, all the hype, all the fear, and all the women who forfeit HRT because they think it causes breast cancer, nothing has ever shown that it does. I'll present all the details on this in the breast cancer unit. Now, Let's talk about the common side effects of HRT. And I'm going to 
tell you, these things don't even belong on the scale. They do not constitute risks. They are mere nuisances. If a woman wants to take HRT for any long-term benefits, she should never let any of these side effects get in her way or induce her to quit it. But you would be surprised. It turns out that more women stop taking HRT for these pesky minor things than they do for any of the real risks. Are you seeing how so much in the world of menopause just gets stranger and stranger? <laughs> Since I just mentioned that breast cancer is not a risk of taking HRT, let's start with breast tenderness. It's very common for a woman to notice breast tenderness just days after starting HRT. And her first inclination is to think it indicates evidence that HRT causes breast cancer. But let's go back to basics and use logic to address this. Your breasts consist of glandular tissue that is supposed to respond to estrogen and progesterone. They've responded to these two hormones in every single cycle of your entire reproductive life. That's why you had breast tenderness every month at the time of PMS. It's why you had breast tenderness when you first got pregnant. Why would your breasts respond any differently to the estrogen and progesterone and HRT? More significantly, why would you assume that breast tenderness from HRT means breast cancer, but breast tenderness from PMS and pregnancy doesn't? Your breasts don't know the difference. They are just doing what they have always done in response to estrogen and progesterone. The other oddity is that everyone blames the estrogen component as the causative agent for breast cancer. But all studies have always identified the progesterone component as the culprit. Women who take estrogen alone without progesterone have lower rates of breast cancer than those who take estrogen with progesterone in study after study. So while breast pain is a pain, it is not a risk factor for anything. And it is no reason to stop HRT. It usually goes away. And if it doesn't, you can adjust your regimen and take a different kind of progesterone to alleviate the tenderness. Next is vaginal bleeding while on HRT. Now the technical term for this is breakthrough bleed. Breakthrough bleeding means that you bleed when you are not supposed to. It may be that you bleed at the wrong time on a cyclic regimen, or it may mean that you bleed at all on a continuous regimen. Either way, all it signifies is that the balance between your estrogen and progesterone isn't quite right. In most cases, it means that you have too much estrogen or too little progesterone. And all it requires is a bit of tweaking. And that's what I do with a lot of women in consultations. If you go about it logically, you can find a solution that resolves the breakthrough bleeding. So if you have a problem with this, schedule a consultation with me. I will be very happy to help you. But there's another side to this. Breakthrough bleeding can be an early warning sign of uterine cancer. So always inform your doctor. You may need some tests to ensure that it is not uterine cancer. And I'll be teaching you about all these procedures in the unit on uterine cancer. Next are weight gain and bloating on HRT. We're going to group these two side effects. They are variations on the same theme and they are caused by the very same thing. One of the biggest misconceptions about HRT is that it causes weight gain and bloating. Once again, let's go back to basics. Throughout the years of your reproductive life, you had no weight problem except at PMS time. Then you gained a couple of pounds. It was mostly bloating, and it resolved spontaneously when your period started. But then, postmenopause comes along and you lose your estrogen, and BAM! Suddenly you start gaining weight, and it's not just bloating. It doesn't resolve spontaneously. So just stop right there. That alone implies that it is the loss of estrogen that causes weight gain. 
You didn't have a weight problem before you lost your estrogen. It started because you lost your estrogen. If you don't take estrogen replacement, you'll continue to gain weight. The loss of estrogen is to blame for weight gain. So why does everyone blame HRT? HRT replaces your estrogen. If you replace your estrogen, you compensate for the very thing that caused you to start gaining weight in the first place. So this is yet another area where women turn everything completely upside down and sabotage themselves. Postmenopause itself is the cause of your weight gain, not HRT. HRT will help limit your weight gain. And any bloating that you have on HRT is due to the progesterone component. Estrogen has always been the hormone that prevented weight gain. Progesterone has always been the hormone that caused weight gain. Think about pregnancy and PMS again. The weight gain of both pregnancy and PMS are entirely due to progesterone. So you might need to change your progesterone, but you should not stop taking HRT. Doing so just makes you gain more weight. Now for acne. Sometimes a woman who has never had acne ever develops it when she starts HRT. Can you imagine? That's enough to make you feel like a geriatric teenager. <laughs> Once again, acne with HRT is due to the progesterone component. And all it requires is switching to a different kind of progesterone or progestin. This is something I can help you with in a consultation. In the last video on progesterone and the three big diseases, I explained that different progestins have different degrees of similarity to testosterone. And testosterone is the sex hormone that causes acne. So this requires changing to a progestin that is less like testosterone. It's a very easy fix and it doesn't warrant stopping HRT. Finally, we have the side effect of drowsiness. Do you remember the first trimester of pregnancy when you felt so drowsy you could practically sleep standing up? You felt sluggish and lazy and you, all you wanted to do was lie around like a couch potato. Guess which hormone caused that feeling? Ah, you're starting to connect the dots and make sense of things. It's progesterone. It's the hormone of pregnancy. And that drowsy, lazy feeling is good for the baby. It induces mom to rest and relax so that the baby can use more calories to grow. You might have felt a bit sluggish at the time of PMS too. That's when progesterone is at its highest during your menstrual cycle. So once again, all you have to do for this is switch or adjust your progesterone. It is an absolute myth promoted by the alternative community that progesterone helps you sleep. Progesterone does not give you a good night's sleep. Estrogen does that. Progesterone makes you wake up sluggish and drowsy and you walk through your day like a zombie because you are so sluggish you can't function. So don't fall for that kind of marketing. It is not accurate. And you won't be accurate if you're drowsy all day as a result of progesterone. Okay, so that does it for the side effects of HRT. And I'm not going to put a weight on the scale for them because they are not risks. And they are easily, easily resolved. To summarize thus far, the true risks of HRT include uterine cancer, heart attack, stroke, and blood clots. And the side effects of taking HRT include breast tenderness, vaginal bleeding, weight gain, bloating, acne, and drowsiness. Now we have to balance the risks of taking HRT against the risks of not taking HRT. Well, you already know the risks of not taking HRT. I've given you three huge units on the three big diseases that are due to estrogen deficiency. And of course, I'm not going to rehash all of that here. The goal of this video is to pit the risks of taking HRT against the risks of not taking HRT. So what you have to do is weigh all of these things you put on this left side of the scale against the three big diseases on the other side of the scale. So if I had add a fairly heavy weight for heart attack and a even less heavy weight for osteoporosis, and a heavier weight for Alzheimer's, oh my, 
Which side weighs more for you? And once again, the estrogen window comes into play. Regardless of whether you are past the 10-year mark without estrogen, this could go either way. Your risks of taking HRT could weigh more, or your risks of not taking HRT could weigh more. The balancing is one thing against another. That's the key. This balancing of one thing against another is at the root of choosing the best options for your menopause. It's your comfort zone for assumption of the risk. We all have different levels of comfort with different risks. Your scale and your comfort with assumption of the risks are all that matter. The weights you assign to each of these factors are your own. Don't worry about anybody else's scale. No two women are the same with regard to their comfort zones for assuming different risks. And if you want my help balancing your weights, just schedule a consultation with me at menopausetailor.me. So here's a simple chart depicting the things that belong on the two sides of your scale. As usual, if you want to print out the chart, you can find it in the link just below the screen or at my website, menopausetailor.me. Okay, we're done for today. Join me again next week when I'll balance your fear of breast cancer against your fear of the three big diseases of estrogen deficiency. Until then, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please subscribe. Bye!